I'm delighted today to welcome Daniel Salmasi, Acting Director of the Kennedy Institute of Ethics at Georgetown, where he is also the inaugural Andre Helliger's Professor of Biomedical Ethics. He's the author of, or editor of a number of important books, including Methods in Medical Ethics, which was published by Georgetown University Press. So thank you for joining us today, Daniel. Glad to be here. Thank you. So I thought we'd start maybe with a, um, a very general question. So we're, we're seeing frightening increases in COVID-19 cases in many US states. Um, and this surge in cases is again, um, leading to speculation that hospitals and healthcare systems could be overwhelmed. So in these situations, how do we ration healthcare resources ethically? Yeah, it's a, a real problem and one that bioethicists have been uh, grappling with theoretically for years, um, but um, this pandemic has actually made, uh, made real. Um, uh, as you uh, and all of the um, listeners probably know, New York came very close to actually having to ration. Um, and in Northern Italy, to the best I understand, although it was never formalized, um, they actually did have to resort to, um, uh, to rationing of, of healthcare. Um, and um, the, the way that I sort of approach this is that many people have thought that, oh, once we're in a situation like this, we have to change our ethics um, because it's um, such a novel situation. My view is that um, our ethics are there to guide us <laughs> and that the ethics don't change. We apply the ethics that we've had for a long time to a new situation. Right. And so um, the way I would approach this is that you would say that it's ethics as usual, just with a, a very different circumstance. So we say, uh, first, does the patient need, um, let's say, the ventilator? Um, the second question would be, what's the patient's prognosis? Um, do they, in fact, have an, an illness which is going to kill them in the next uh, six months anyway, and maybe they wouldn't be an appropriate candidate for, um, uh, for the care. And then last is in terms of effectiveness. Will this actually work for the person um, and um, will they have a chance of getting out of the hospital alive? Um, and I think that that's the way we ought to approach this. And if we have to choose, then we choose um, to maximize the number of lives that we save um, by um, applying the, the treatments um, as effectively as we possibly can. Um, there have been um, other ways that people have done this. So for instance, um, Alabama had a crisis standard of care and said they wouldn't give it to retarded people if they had to choose. Um, that seems to me to be discriminatory. Mm. Um, uh, there have been um, other people who've tried to do it on the basis of age. Um, and again, that seems to be discriminatory against um, older, uh, older persons. Certainly being older will decrease the chance that you're going to get out of the hospital alive. So it's a consideration, but it shouldn't be that we say that you know, everybody over 75 gets pushed to palliative care um, while we concentrate on the, the younger people. Um, again, it will be, does the patient need it? Um, uh, what's their prognosis? Are they going to die soon anyway? Um, and then we choose to maximize the number of lives we will save um, by deciding on the uh, effectiveness of the treatment. Um, and that's probably the, the safest and most just way um, to do it. Thank you. Um, so I guess here we're talking about how to ration care at the level of a kind of individual patient. But one of the things that's been striking about this uh, crisis has been, at least in this country, the lack of kind of coordination from the top. So you have cities and states and you know, jurisdictions fighting over uh, ventilator supplies or PPE. And I was wondering if you could talk us through the ethics of, of rationing at that level as well. Yeah, um, one consideration that's always um, a part of medical ethics um, is concern for the common good. Um, but we don't always focus on that uh, when we're deciding for instance, in, under normal circumstances, whether we're going to put somebody on a ventilator or not, or who gets a ventilator, et cetera. Um, but in cases like this, um, yes, there needs to be a sense that the common good is not just what's good for me, or not just what's good for my hospital, but what's good for us as a people, as a city, as a nation. 
Um, so um, uh, I would um, uh, give an example that um, uh, here at uh, Georgetown, where our hospital is part of a system called uh, MedStar. Um, and part of what we did was to approach this as a system. Um, mm. So that um, when there was um, at the surge that we had, when there were lots of people overwhelming the affiliated hospitals in rural St. Mary's County, some of those patients were transferred um, up to Georgetown so that we could share the resources um, that way um, and act as a system. We, we function better as a system together, whether that's a hospital system, a city, um, or a nation. Uh, another uh, you know, um, side of this, though, is that this is a novel virus, right? Um, we don't know what's most effective. So I'm not as concerned, actually, by the fact that different states were doing things differently or that different universities have different plans for reopening, because in some ways we have to try a few things out to see what works best. So, um, so I don't think that uniformity um, is the best practice, um, but I certainly think that um, sharing, um, again, as was done in New York State, where the governor said, you know, send, your, send your ventilators from um, upstate where you don't have any cases down to New York City where we need them desperately um, um, is a reasonable way to go. Yeah, thank you. So if we took this up a, another level to the whole world, um, one of the things that I noticed in the past maybe week or so in the newspaper was the U.S. cornering the market on one of the therapeutic drugs. Um, is it called Redemsevir? I might be mispronouncing that. Mm -hmm. but. Um, and so it got me thinking about, um, you know, when there is a vaccine, you know, whether countries will be kind of competing not only to be first, but to, you know, to um, kind of corner the market and, you know, and when you start to think about it, like, um, until everybody in the world has a vaccine, unless we're, you know, going to eliminate all, you know, international travel, no one individual country is going to be completely safe. But I was wondering how you how we think about it at that level as kind of like citizens of the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we we forget that pandemic means the whole yeah. world, right? Pan, it's everybody, um, and we're all in this together. And together doesn't just mean um, our nation, but um, all nations. So I think certainly um, people in the developing world um, have a claim in justice to healthcare resources all the time, and are usually on the short end of the stick in normal times, um, let alone in, um, in the setting of a particular crisis. But I think part of what you were also hinting at is that even if you want to just pursue this in, the, uh, in a self-interested mode, um, given the globalization of the world, given international uh, travel, um, it is in the interests of citizens of the United States uh, that um, India and Sub-Saharan Africa not become pools where large numbers of people are infected with the virus because it can't be contained within national borders. Um, and so, um, uh, so we have obligations to all people in justice, um, but even if you just want to say it from our own self-interest, sharing is better. Right, thank you. So I wanted to switch gears a little bit to talk about um, our responsibilities as individuals. Um, so how, how would, what kind of advice would you give an individual in terms of how to weigh risks and probabilities, um, given that expert advice itself seems to be fluid and, and sometimes contradictory? Yeah, I've been uh, writing a uh, column for the, online for the Washingtonian called uh, Ask a Coronavirus Ethicist, and it's all been these kinds of questions. You know, while I spend my time in the hospital, deciding what our policy will be for ventilator allocation. You're right, the vast majority of people are not going to fortunately face that question, but they face questions like, you know, should I wear a mask? Um, um, should I go visit my uh, mother when I haven't seen her in many, many months? Um, those, kinds of, uh, those kinds of questions. What happens if somebody gives me an N95 mask? What do I do with it? Right? Yeah. These are the day-to-day um, questions that, uh, that uh, people are asking. Um, and yes, you're right, and it's frustrating for people that the advice seems fluid and sometimes contradictory. Um, even uh, Anthony Fauci, sometimes called the raspy voice of reason, several, several months ago was 
saying, oh, you don't, don't need a mask. <laughs> now he's saying everybody needs a mask, right? So, so as we encounter more, the advice changes, and that's difficult for the average uh, person to, uh, to understand. Um, but I think that um, one should be prudent and sensible. Um, it is um, not necessary to be overly fearful, isolate oneself completely for most people who are healthy. Um, what we want to do is decrease the risk. Uh, we can't absolutely eliminate all risk. So my, um, uh, my advice is that we continue um, socially uh, distancing, at least until there are treatments um, um, available or vaccines uh, uh, available, um, that um, if you are out, in, in my opinion, if you're out um, in um, the outside environment and not coming within six feet of people, um, that masks probably aren't necessary. Um, if you can really um, avoid coming in very close contact with, uh, with people, um, absolutely, if you are inside anywhere, like in an air-conditioned store going shopping now or um, uh, anything like that, masks are um, important in that set. Um, and, and part of the reason is that they, um, uh, again, it's part of the common good. They're probably not going to protect you very much if somebody sneezes on you. But what happens if you are an asymptomatic carrier, what the mask does to prevent you from spreading um, unknowns to yourself or to others, the virus to other people. So we owe it to each other in settings in which the virus can spread. And that's mostly indoors or if you're outdoors, if you're in close proximity you know, to people. So be sensible, don't, um, don't shut down the economy because that hurts a lot of uh, people as well. Yeah, thank you. So we have a question from a participant um, uh, on a different area. Uh, how much has the legal realm intruded into your work and that of me medical ethicists in general, for better or worse? And do ethicists going forward need to take legal courses? Uh, well, everything that's uh, legal isn't uh, ethical, and everything that's ethical isn't legal, right? <laughs> so that's, that's the first premise. Um, um, the law certainly, um, um, uh, in a good society, has some um, uh, is informed by ethics. Um, but you can't make everything um, illegal that's morally wrong, right? So we have to have some difference between the two. And ethics can judge laws, right? So we can say that a particular law like you know, apartheid, for instance, is an unjust law. Um, so um, so um, we use the law when it's a just law as a sort of rough guideline for how we should act, but it's not all, uh, all of ethics. Um, and um, many bioethicists are lawyers. We work closely with um, our colleagues at the Georgetown Law School, Larry Gostin, um, uh, for instance, um, uh, to help to make our laws as just as we can um, so that um, we um, uh, have a, a, a bioethical system which is informed by the law, um, but not overwhelmed by the law um, and not limited by the law. Thank you. So my next question is kind of at the intersection, I think, of ethics and law, um, and it's about privacy. So it seems like there's, you know, wide agreement that the best we can do, say, on a university campus until there's a vaccine is to test, trace, and then isolate uh, positive cases. But it, it does seem like using cell phone data or perhaps an app, you know, is going to be one of the, the best ways to, to do that. So I was wondering if you could you know, talk us through the kind of difficult privacy questions um, that that kind of regime raises. Yeah, public um, health ethics um, is an important part of bioethics, um, and it, particularly in the setting of something like a, like a pandemic. Um, it, um, it is um, a, a cornerstone of the doctor-patient relationship that we um, protect the confidentiality of patients. Um, but there are some limits to confidentiality. Um, so uh, one of those would be if um, uh, someone is um, a, um, a serious uh, threat of imminent harm to a very identifiable person, like a psychiatrically ill person who says they're going to kill their girlfriend, right? Uh, then we have um, uh, uh, an obligation to, uh, to uh, breach confidentiality in order to warn people in settings like Public health is another area where there are some limits on confidentiality. 
but we don't want them to go overboard. So we've got to have some balance with it. Um, uh, and, um, and the main way this is done is through contact tracing, right? So that if someone is infected, what's been done is to ask that person um, to, to declare who they've been in contact with, often for sexually transmitted diseases, but um, other things like tuberculosis, we do the same thing. Um, so it's not unprecedented. And then we try to um, uh, find those persons and test them to make sure they are not infected quarantine them if they've had a significant exposure to make sure they don't develop the disease, et cetera. Um, so it's a limited um, uh, breach of confidentiality um, and privacy for the sake of the common good, for the good of, uh, of all of us. Uh, but there is a principle in public health ethics of restraint. You do only as um, much as is necessary in order to achieve um, the public health goal that you have in mind. Um, so you don't go um, uh, overboard and, um, and be too invasive um, or too intrusive. Um, so you could go to the extreme, for instance, of uh, China, right, where they're using GPS systems on cell phones and a system of surveillance cameras to find everybody who's been within um, uh, six uh, feet of, of uh, an infected person and you know, get them immediately tested and quarantined or we saw pictures from Wuhan of grandmothers being dragged into paddy wagons for violating curfews, right? We don't want to go to that extreme. Um, and so I'm very cautious about the use of some of these apps, um, partly because um, some of the data isn't necessary to achieve the public health goal. Um, and then we have to worry about what else the corporations may be doing with that data, which is not, has nothing to do with the public health goal um, and um, be very strict on limiting what they can do with that if we're gonna use any of those data at all. Yeah, thank you. So we have some great questions from some participants. So I'm gonna try and feed those to you uh, in sure. the next few minutes. Um, so uh, this one is about hospitals and visitors and it says that um, most hospitals have strict visitor policies in place, um, appropriately so, and yet this has heightened the isolation many patients experience. I know that a dying patient was denied access to their priest of long standing. Do you have thoughts on how we can mitigate the isolation, um, which is common to modern medicine, even now more so during the pandemic? Oh, it's a terrific, terrific question. It's been very sad to see patients so um, isolated by this, by this disease. And as she's suggesting for um, um, persons of faith to be separated from uh, their um, clergy or other members of their community and then a sense of um, sacramental religions like Catholicism to be uh, blocked from even receiving sacraments. Um, I think that, again, there should be some balance. We, um, I'm an Aristotelian at heart, right? So I don't, I think that in most cases we have to strike the mean. What's the, what's the right way to go here between being too loose um, and too strict um, in terms of life? So yes, I think we need to isolate people because it can spread through a hospital and that's terrible. Um, it affects not only uh, staff members, but it infects other patients and can infect visitors and then go out into the, into the community. Um, but um, we should be careful um, to do what we can to mitigate the isolation of patients. So one of those has been the use of technology. So uh, at our hospital, we had a drive to um, um, have people give um, iPads um, to donate, to um, uh, have patients able to talk to their loved ones through, um, uh, through some sort of electronic device like an, uh, like an iPad. Um, second, um, uh, that certainly when patients are dying, um, to be able to um, have some kinds of uh, relaxation so that people can, patients, uh, family members can wear protective uh, gear and visit um, under those circumstances. And um, again, at um, MedStar Georgetown, we even um, had a protocol to allow um, a clergy and, uh, to, to visit, again, using protective uh, gear um, to administer sacraments um, um, or um, visit patients um, under um, significant circumstances um, like um, someone who was, who was dying. So isolation, yes, but I think she's very uh, right um, to, uh, to be asking, can we 
um, yeah, keep that to, um, uh, can, can we relax that in certain circumstances for the good of patients? Thank you. Um, so we have another question that's about how the um, Black and Latinx communities in the U.S. have been hit so much harder uh, by coronavirus, so I think uh, in terms of death, but also, you know, perhaps the number of cases and the economic impact. And so do you have thoughts about an ethically responsible um, response to that situation? Yes, I think it's a question really of, of um, systemic justice um, and injustice in our society. Um, it is certainly um, a, a true uh, that um, uh, from an economic point of view and a medical point of view, um, uh, the, the Latinx and the um, African American communities have been disproportionately impacted by this. Um, part of that, um, um, a large measure of it is because of a burden of pre existing diseases in those communities diabetes, high blood pressure. Um, uh, high cholesterol, um, heart failure, um, all of which predispose people to having a poor outcome with um, uh, COVID or to um, uh, getting the disease in the first place. And then part of the reason for the high burden of those diseases may be partially genetic, but we have to recognize that part of it is also um, systemic injustices that um, decrease people's access to healthcare um, in, the, in the first place. Um, so, um, so it's a very complex situation. Um, what I think uh, is the best thing that could come out of this is that we um, um, are more aware, particularly in the setting of Black, Black Lives Matter, for instance, um, that these systemic injustices existed before COVID. Um, COVID has brought them to the fore um, and that we um, have an, an ethical obligation once this is over um, to learn from, uh, from that and try to correct those injustices. You can't do it at the bedside, right? You can't uh, sort of mix, you know, undo somebody's diabetes at the bedside. Um, uh, what we uh, can do is learn from this and try to um, correct the pre-existing injustices once we're on the other side of the pandemic. Thank you. Um, so I want to ask you a little bit about, about treatments and the ethics um, in, in that area. So how do we decide when experimental drugs or treatments are to be used during a pandemic or a health emergency like this? How much risk is allowable? And how do we decide, you know, who gets access to, you know, potentially risky, but also potentially life-saving treatments? Yes, again, a very uh, complicated set of, uh, set of questions. Um, when you have a novel disease, there are no treatments. <laughs> and so uh, people keep trying whatever they possibly uh, can. And you know, again, this can be very disconcerting for people. You get a preliminary study that says um, you know, hydroxychloroquine works, and then you do good enough research, you find out that it doesn't. Um, we now have some research that says that um, steroids um, help for people who are severely ill. Um, but that gets complicated because people can misinterpret what that means because someone who's already on steroids for, let's say, asthma or for an, another pre existing immunologic disease may be more at risk for uh, getting the virus in the first place. Um, so, um, um, in this sort of a setting, um, um, we want to try new treatments um, and see if we can find anything um, that works. Uh, uh, Indesivir um, is the first thing that we know that has any efficacy. It's not spectacular. This is not a cure. Um, uh, it um, uh, somewhat increases the chances of survival by about 20%. Statistically significant, um, but certainly not, um, uh, not a cure. Um, so how do you um, go about deciding how to do this? Typically, what's very difficult for people, because once somebody is sick and their relative is in the hospital, they all want access to the experimental um, uh, treatment. Um, um, and yet, the best way to test the treatment is to try it on people um, who are um, not so sick that it's um, be, um, you know, beyond the possibility that anything could help them, and yet sick enough that you can see a difference uh, because if they were going to get 
cured anywhere or, um, over the disease anyway, um, uh, those are not the target population because you won't be able to show a difference. So you try to find this sweet spot of those sorts of patients who, for whom there could be a potential benefit of an intervention, but um, who are not so uh, far gone. Um, and that's difficult to, uh, for people to sometimes recognize um, that that's um, the, the kind of population which you at least initially want to try. Now, once there's something available, then you come to um, what's called in research ethics, the position of equipoise. Right? If someone is sick enough to need a drug right now, um, you probably don't want to give them a placebo, which is the way you would do it initially, but want to give them the sort of best alternative. Um, so you would probably um, want to design a trial in which you want to get better than remdesivir. So you give, the, instead of a placebo, would give remdesivir, and then try the new drug um, for the experimental uh, population to get randomized to that group um, to see if it's better than remdesivir. Because um, once you have treatments available, um, then it becomes unethical not to give something to people who could, uh, who could potentially use it. Right, right. Thank you. So I think we have time for one, one more question. Um, well, this goes fast. <laughs> I, I, I say this every week that uh, we could talk about these big issues for a long time, but, uh, uh, but I, I thought I'd end with, um, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about um, how to balance treating you know, acute cases of COVID-19 with um, making sure that people who have, you know, exist pre-existing conditions, you know, whether it's heart disease or, or whatever, um, you know, that they have access to their uh, doctors and, and, and treatment. And I saw a study or at least an article uh, recently saying that these fears um, that we were going to see an explosion of heart disease or uh, other um, ailments, uh, you know, has not come to pass. And I was speculating that Americans, you know, go to the doctor too much so that, you know, if they're going a little bit less, you know, th there might be less harm than, than we would have thought. But I wondered if you could kind of address this area of, you know, how do we make sure that someone who might be afraid to go to their doctor at the moment gets treatment and balance that with the resources needed to treat people who are dying of coronavirus? Yes. So during a surge like we had in March, April, May in, uh, uh, here in Washington, D.C., um, it was necessary actually to shut down elective procedures, to um, uh, try to um, convert um, uh, intensive uh, regular units into intensive care units, to try to accommodate all the patients who were coming in um, who, had, um, uh, who had COVID. So um, uh, it did make a, uh, it did make a difference in that um, we postponed elective surgery um, and also um, as far as I know, maybe you read a uh, different study, um, there has been some evidence of, of impact of um, postponement of medical care um, on the uh, on the general uh, population, partly because of having to postpone elective uh, procedures and partly because, as you're suggesting, people were very fearful um, of coming to the, uh, coming to the hospital. Um, we're now beginning to see, uh, I'm still practicing part-time, um, a rush of people coming back because we now, um, at least in Washington, D.C., have gotten to a low level um, of, uh, of COVID. It's not eliminated, um, but we're not at the point of being overwhelmed. Um, so we want to welcome our patients uh, back to make sure that they're getting all the, uh, the proper treatment um, because um, postponing, let's say, chemotherapy, chemotherapy for your breast cancer <laughs> for another six months is not a smart idea yeah. because you will die from breast cancer um, sooner than, uh, and that the risk of that is higher um, than um, getting COVID coming to the hospital. Yeah, well, thank you uh, for participating today. Daniel, I really appreciate it. This has been fascinating. I really appreciate your sharing your insight. Thank you. Oh, it's a, uh, a real pleasure. I hope this was helpful to the, uh, to the listeners. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your great questions and those that came from the listeners as well. Thank you. And so I just wanted to say to everyone that next week we're going to be talking with uh, American University and Cairo professor Reem Basiuni, who's going to be talking about her dual career as a novelist and as a linguist. So thank you again, Daniel, and uh, thanks everyone for participating.
Take Thank care. You. Stay well. Take care. Be good. Bye.